Welcome to this evening's installment of the National Humanities Center New Virtual Book Club Series. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the Center, and it's my privilege to serve as the host for this evening's event. First of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. With all that's happening around us right now, I think we all welcome the chance to connect with others and to share a conversation about literature and the ways it influences how we see the world and ourselves. At our inaugural book club last week, we had some technical glitches and I filled some of the airtime by reading a poem. And the response to that was, was very, very positive. So I'd like to read another poem tonight before I introduce this evening's guest. This is a poem by Billy Collins and it's called Dharma. And a lot of us now are spending lots of times with our pets. And I thought this would be an appropriate poem. The way the dog trots out the front door every morning without a hat or an umbrella, without any money or the keys to her doghouse, never fails to fill the saucer of my heart with milky admiration. Who provides a finer example of a life without encumbrance? Thoreau in his curtainless hut with a single plate, a single spoon, Gandhi with his staff and his holy diapers. Off she goes into the material world with nothing but her brown coat and her modest blue collar, following only her wet nose, the twin portals of her steady breathing, followed only by the plume of her tail. If only she did not shove the cat aside every morning and eat all his food. What a model of self-containment she would be. What a paragon of earthly detachment. If only she were not so eager for a rub behind the ears, so acrobatic in her welcomes, if only I were not her God. So before I introduce this evening's guest, Professor Jay Newman, I wanted to point out that while you're only here, you'll only hear our two voices tonight, all of us will be in conversation. So please use the comments section to post your questions or offer your thoughts. I'll be monitoring that part of the conversation and we'll bring your questions to Jane's attention. I also encourage you to respond to one another. We're being joined by people from across the country and this is a wonderful opportunity to interact with others who share your interests. Our guest this evening is Jane Newman, a professor of comparative literature at the University of California, Irvine who has been recognized for the remarkable depth and breadth of her scholarship. From the work of Virgil, Luther, Shakespeare, to early 20th century receptions of the Renaissance and the Baroque, from the history of printing to the history of the stage, early modern science, Simone de Beauvoir, Descartes, and the list goes on and on and on. Professor Newman is the author of three books, Pastoral Conventions, Poetry, Language, and Thought in 17th Century Nuremberg, The Invention of Philology, Gender, Learning, and Power in Lowenstein's Roman Plays, and Benjamin's Library, Modernity, Nation, and the Baroque. Her translation of Eric Auerbach's essays won the Modern Language Association's Scaglioni Prize for a translation of a scholarly study of literature, and she's the editor of the forthcoming Brule Companion to Renaissance and Early Modern Germany. This evening, Jane has graciously agreed to speak to us about the Decameron, Giovanni Boccaccio's 14th century masterpiece involving 10 young people looking to pass the time as they sheltered in a villa outside of Florence, trying to escape the Black Plague. Please join me in welcoming our National Humanities Center trustee, Jane Newman. Welcome, Jane. Hey, Robert. Thanks so much for, for that introduction and welcome to everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you from uh, my study in my home in California. I wanted to thank everyone at the National Humanities Center for putting together this, uh, this book series. I was so moved last week and I'm so looking forward to the, to the rest of the speakers, some of them. Uh, Bert Bert Ehrman is one of my favorite scholars, um, so I do hope uh, that you'll continue to to uh, join us in in these uh, in these really interesting discussions. 
I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself before I get uh, to Boccaccio. Um, uh, and, and Robert told you a little bit about my, my publishing history and so on. Um, I've always been interested, as my children used to say when they were small, uh, in what they called old stuff. And the old stuff was uh, really pretty old uh, in, in, in my uh, experience, but going back all the way to the, to the ancient Greeks and to the, uh, to the Romans, to Homer, Virgil, and so on. Um, I, it's a pretty Western canon I'm interested in. Uh, I unfortunately don't know any Asian languages and uh, to much to my chagrin, I don't know Arabic, but I do know the ancient Greek uh, language and, and Latin. And I was, uh, interestingly, and maybe this will explain to you a little bit about how I'm going to be talking about Boccaccio today. Um, I was taught uh, Latin when I was in elementary school, actually, uh, by a, uh, my teacher, Ruth Fiesel, Miss Fiesel. And Miss Fiesel, I still remember it, uh, taught us Latin as what she called a, a living language. It would be a language with which we would um, converse, really, with the ancients and, and share ideas with them. And so, and that's a kind of bizarre because I, I think only the Pope actually speaks Latin anymore. Uh, so we, but we spoke it, you know, as uh, elementary school kids, it was pretty cool. Uh, and I think this accompanied me uh, when to high school and college, when I continued to, to study uh, Greek and Latin. And then I moved into the Renaissance period. Uh, the Renaissance period, as you may know, is uh, conventionally thought of as uh, the time of the rebirth of antiquity. Uh, and the uh, Renaissance period actually uh, traded in and spoke the uh, languages of antiquity, uh, just like I was taught to do when I was in elementary school. Um, so the 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 fact that I'm interested in the early modern period or the or the Renaissance really had to do with a sort of a long um, history of my acquaintanceship with why we might turn to old stuff. Um, and in that context, I want to give you a, a quote that really speaks very much to me. And now I'm going to share a screen so I can give you that uh, quote. Um, this is a quote by someone whom you may know, uh, Machiavelli. Uh, let's see this over here. When evening has come, this is Machiavelli writing in 1513. When evening has come, I return to my house and go into my study. At the door, I take off my clothes of the day, covered with mud and mire, and I put on my regal and courtly garments and decently reclothed, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where received by them lovingly, I feed on the food that alone is mine and that I was born for. There, I'm not ashamed to speak with them, with the ancients, and to ask them the reason for their actions, and they in their humanity reply to me. And so for the space of four hours, I feel no boredom, I forget every pain, I do not fear poverty, death does not frighten me, I deliver myself entirely to them. And I think that this uh, quote from Machiavelli uh, really sort of describes how I really see myself over the years, having conversed with uh, older texts and older traditions. Um, I, I like to speak with the ancients and with uh, even ancients going up through the Renaissance uh, about the reasons for their actions and they, how they, and I'm, I'm always very impressed how they in their humanity speak back to me or reply to me with my questions. And so I'd like to sort of begin talking to you about Boccaccio because I, I, I see that I'm sort of in conversation with him and we can be in conversation with him and to see how we can learn from him more to be perfectly honest uh, about ourselves than about him, even as we converse with him about what drove uh, Boccaccio to write the Decameron. So let me move now into a, a kind of short lecture, if you will, about Boccaccio's Decameron. And at the end of that, after sort of giving you my uh, explanation of what I find so compelling and urgent about the questions he asks in the Decameron, I hope that we can get into a conversation about what you might have found interesting about the Decameron. So let me tell you a, li a little bit about it. Robert gave a little bit of an introduction, but let me tell you a little bit more. Okay. So Boccaccio's to Cameron, there he is, Giovanni Boccaccio, 14th century. Some people say he's a late medieval writer uh, or maybe one of the first Renaissance writers. His dates kind of make him a, a sort of a liminal figure, if you will, right on the cusp of what does it mean to turn away from the medieval period and into modernity. The Decameron itself uh, is um, uh, something that made people who like me uh, know the ancient languages will know right away what it's about from its Greek title actually, Deca means 10 in Greek, hemera means days in Greek. So it's a collection of 10 stories told over 10 days by a collection of people who leave Florence uh, where the bubonic plague has hit Florence in 1348. 
Um, there's one additional story, uh, uh, the story of day four, intro, uh, the introduction to day, sto uh, to day four, uh, which is the story of Filippo Balducci and his son, and I'll come back th to that in a sec. Um, that is the 101st story, uh, really, actually, of the Decameron. And because of its sort of outlier um, um, position, we want to pay attention, a special attention to actually what goes on in that uh, extra story, that 101st story. So what happens is that these uh, oh yeah, I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, the, the 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 plague. Um, yeah, the Black Death. Okay, and these are some um, uh, some images that I thought you might find sort of shocking and, and interesting. These days, the uh, the plague, this bubonic plague, is often referred to as the Black Death. Uh, historically, however, that was um, not really what it was uh, referred to as. It was referred to as a pestilence uh, or an epidemic. Uh, it, it really was referred to as mortalitas, as mortality. Uh, the, the idea that it was called the Black Death really comes from its Latin term, uh, the Mors Nigra or the Mors Astra in Latin, that is that, that, that blackness which has to do with Hades and sending you to your death. And that term Black Death actually only came into use um, in English after the 1750s. And I wanna give you a little bit more of a, of a picture of the, um, of the Black Death there, that a close up um, of one of those images. Um, this is a really magnificent image uh, of how, how many people actually died during the Balkanic Plague of the Black Death. They had to be uh, really stacked up, as you see here, and buried wherever there was room for them. So there were no um, protective uh, devices for these frontline responders then, as you can see. Um, actually, those protective devices only came a little bit later in the uh, 18th century or the 17th century, actually. Uh, and these are, are pictures of the historical uh, costumes, if you will, or protective devices and protective gear that doctors actually wore um, against fighting against the bubonic plague. Uh, and th th these seem sort of caricatures, but this is actually a, a, a leather um, jacket really to try to keep off um, the, uh, the, the um, infection. Um, in Boccaccio's Decameron, in any case, there is uh, this, this brigade, what is called the brigade uh, of um, seven women and three men flees out of Florence to escape this plague that was going on. Uh, and that's the, the 10 of them who escape, okay? The so-called frame story of this text of Boccaccio's Decameron uh, that describes the impact of the plague in Florence is, is actually very pretty accurate historically. And we read about that in the first day introduction um, to the Decameron. Uh, Boccaccio in fact may not have really been there uh, in uh, Florence at the time. He actually seems to have been in Ravenna, but his father was. And so he would have heard about the details of uh, the, the plague in Florence at that time. It's described in the introduction the first day, the plague is a deadly havoc, uh, the deadly pestilence that originated in early spring, actually in March, and it lasted until July. The symptoms, which we saw in some of the illustrations, were swelling in the armpits and in the groin, we'll remember that. And there were various reactions that the people of Florence had, Boccaccio says. Uh, there was self-isolation, self-indulgence, social distancing, and so on. People really sort of were only to speak to their families and their neighbors from a distance. It spread very rapidly to Florentines who did not shelter in place, and the wealthy retreated from the urban center out to the countryside, which is what the brigade does. I think all of this sounds rather familiar to us. Uh, the, uh, the springtime uh, onset of this plague, the um, various reactions and so on, the fact that the wealthy retreat to the Hamptons and so on, sounds terribly familiar. But in the text of Boccaccio's uh, stories, the details of this frame story are very, very local. The brigade assembles, for example, at a church called Santa Maria Novelle in Florence. So those of you who have been to Florence will be familiar with that church, I think. And when it retreats to this place where the stories are told, that's actually uh, not very far from Florence, this frame story tells us, okay? The enframed stories, however, uh, the hundred stories that we, I mentioned uh, that are told uh, are actually um, very international, unlike the frame story, they take place all over Europe, in fact. They sort of, the parameters are Boccaccio's entire known world. Okay? And I think here Boccaccio is suggesting to us that the foibles of humanity as we are confront them in the stories are really international, universal, maybe common to all of us. 
And that extra story of Filippo Valducci and his son, which I mentioned before, captures this juxtaposition pretty nicely between the frame and the stories, right? Because Balducci is described very much as a Florentine and he wants to take his young son, his two-year-old son away from Florence um, and sort of protect him from the ills of the city, not the plague, but just in general city life. So he brings this young man up uh, in a cave until uh, the young man is 18. And then he dares to take his young son who's never seen anybody else but his father back into Florence uh, on a shopping trip and he sees the young son at 18, sees some women uh, and says, and his, he says to his father, what are those? And his father says, oh, they're very dangerous. They're goslings, don't get near them. They might bite these women. And the young man who's never seen a woman before in his life says, oh, let's take a gosling home with us. Okay, and you see that actually in the, uh, in the illustration here. And Balducci ends up by, by saying here, um, his wits were actually no match for nature when his son actually has sort of desire for these women, having never seen a woman before in his life. So in this unfinished story, Boccaccio asks us to consider what makes us quite local, meaning Florentine, and what is it that we share actually with all of humankind? So, um, and, and I wanna make a, another point, which is uh, will tell us a little bit about this kind of humanity focused nature of the Decameron. It's a very important uh, point. Boccaccio's uh, Decameron is often seen as the human comedy that answers and supplements Dante's divine comedy that we actually heard about uh, last week in our book club series. For anyone who, who knows these two texts, Boccaccio's citations of his fellow Florentine author, Dante are everywhere. Uh, day one and story one very prominently placed. We have a very, very wily uh, creature guy named uh, Sierra Ceparello, who we, the, the narrator tells us about his multiple sins, false testimony, enmity, blasphemy, gluttony, and so on. Sierra Ceparello could be in every single uh, uh, circle of Dante's hell, in other words. But when Ser Ceparello in the story falls ill in Burgundy and seeks to be buried there, he actually gets away with all of his lies. And he tells lies about what a wonderful guy he was. And at the very end of the story, he's actually beatified. He's turned into a saint. And we've, so we sort of see that's a kind of a reversal really of what happens in Dante's Inferno with the people who are in the Inferno. And there are very many other characters from Dante's Inferno uh, and from Dante's um, uh, poems, the Divine Comedy in general, who are embedded within uh, Boccaccio's tales. So I like what I like to think of this is that Boccaccio takes Dante's divinely ordered world with its kind of vertical logic of God being in charge and all the sinners uh, up and down the scale. And Boccaccio lays that on his side and says, this isn't the divine comedy where God rules. This is rather hu the human comedy. And his stories uh, are team with a kind of diverse humanity from all over uh, of his known world. But in this case, the judgment about them is left up to us rather than as in the case of the divine comedy, uh, God has put them various sinners in their various uh, places. Now, the stories though of the Decameron, even though they are, um, uh, some of them literary have literary predecessors in Dante, for example, seem quite real and in sync with their time. Like the stories themselves, remember I said that they took place all over Don, uh, Boccaccio's uh, known world, the historical plague of the frame story, the one that hits Florence, was actually international in scope. It actually began in China where it killed 5 million people and it spread throughout India and then kind of moved all the way through the Middle East and hit again the Genoese merchant town of Kafa. It's now known as Feodosio on the Black Sea. And what is so extraordinary about this moment when the uh, plague actually arrives in Kafa there is that Kafa itself as being a Genoese uh, merchant kind of uh, uh, location had, was under siege by the Tartars and by their competitor merchants, the Venetians. And all of a sudden the besiegers suddenly um, seemed to, to die off. And the, all the people in Kafa who were being besieged said, well, why are they all dying off? And it turned out that all the besiegers actually had the plague. And so they began to win, that is the people in Kaffa, because the plague was killing off the people who were besieging them. But in one final act of war, the uh, Tartars used the catapults that they had been using before to throw um, fireballs at the city, right? And they put the uh, plague ridden bodies of their own compatriots into these catapults and launched them into the city of Kaffa. So the Genoese quickly fled at this point back to Genoa, having tried to get rid of these corpses and so on. 
But of course, with themselves, they took the plague back to Italy with them. So it's a kind of an interesting tale, I think. Our takeaway, I think, from this conversation with the past about this past plague, okay, is that that plague, the bubonic plague that we are talking about in um, uh, Boccaccio's Decameron, spread as a result of a world connected by networks of war and business. It was spread by means of technology, that is these catapults, but also the ingenuity of military people, okay? Sort of a primitive biological warfare, if you will, okay? Moreover, and I think this, this is really sort of the interesting point, it was not a Chinese disease, even though it did actually decimate China, this one province of China, but even back then in the 14th century, it was Italians who brought it home with them. The Italians spread the plague into Italy, in fact. The immediate impact of that plague was a huge number of deaths, as you see here. Some people estimate up to 200 million deaths, with around 30 to 60% of Europe's populations died. 50% of Florence, Florence's uh, um, uh, population, 50% of London's, uh, or Paris's, I'm sorry, uh, population and so on, and one third of the population of the Middle East. The long-term effects of this uh, demographic kind of uh, dub whammy of the, of the bubonic plague was that population's levels took about 200 years to recover, okay? So when you have 50% of your populace uh, killed by this, um, it really has massive, massive impacts in a sort of demographic and social and political sense. I'd like that in an environmental sense as well. I'd like to suggest that maybe not all of the impact of this was negative, as horrific as the plague was, there was massive reforestation actually in Europe because the peasants died off and the, um, many of the farmlands couldn't be uh, farmed anymore. And slowly over 200 uh, years, the forests kind of encroached back in. This was a, a good thing, okay, in the short run, but it then also led to what was called the Little Ice Age of the 16th century because all of the earth's temperatures dropped at that point um, as the carbon uh, uh, dioxide was actually absorbed by more forests and so on. So these long-term you know, uh, impact of, of, of these kinds of plagues make us ask questions, or I ask questions uh, all the time, what's gonna be the impact of COVID-19 on our social frame? Many people say actually that this was the uh, end of the feudal period, right? So many peasants died off that labor became uh, more expensive. They could demand higher wages. And so this was the, 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 the upheaval of, of a new kind of um, social formation in Europe at the time. So in other words, there, there are many, many implications for these historical moments and what we can kind of learn from them. In any case, let's go back to the Black Death and, and see these changes that it wrought on, on late medieval Renaissance Europe. At the time, these changes were conceived of as profoundly upsetting and disorienting. It was perceived as a, a real disordering of what we knew as the medieval order at the time. And it was very upsetting, changes also upsetting. But I'd like to think of this crisis of the bubonic plague hitting Europe at the time as being um, really derived from the Greek root word crisis, which actually means the Greek root word, and here I'm showing myself off as a kind of a nerd, okay? Um, the, the root word means decision. And that word crisis has been used since the 17th century to indicate really actually the moment when a disease, when we are sick, reaches its peak. And so uh, it has to decide, the disease has to decide uh, whether it's going to get worse or better. So the crisis is the sort of pinnacle point and it's really not clear which way the disease is going to go. So the, the disease is making a decision in other words. I'm interested actually in human responses to crises in general and what our conversation with the past, with the crises of the past allows us to think about how we can respond to the crisis of the present, namely our current crisis. In any case, uh, in the Decameron, the fictional frame story uh, depicts this crisis of the plague in this way, that is, as a moment of profound disorder. And we remember that Boccaccio says that all respect for the laws of God and man broke down, family loyalties become, become shaky, husbands and wives turn against one another, and all customs of morality and sexual propriety uh, sort of dis dissolve. And the class hierarchy collapses as well, and there are food supply uh, problems, really. And this sort of understanding of what the impact of the plague did on the social formations of Europe at the time can be seen in this triumph of death fresco. And I just wanna give you a little bit larger a version of it. Um, this is where when death intervenes, um, it sort of attacks all. And you can see uh, the, the numerous kinds of people. There's some 
poor people over here and then the more well-to-do over here. They, these people may be the brigade, the brigata of Boccaccio's stories, okay? But it even attacks holy men, even though people pray and so on. We see the, the popes down here uh, felled by death of the plague and so on in this bishop here. So the plague when seen as this moment of kind of profound disordering sort of spares none. Okay? This disorder in this text is met um, both within the stories themselves and in the structure of the text by what I call attempts to impose order, to establish some kind of order, which signals that we can respond to the realities of the real world sometimes with human artifice or with, with our own thinking and ingenuity. And I'd like to think about this and show you where it actually happens in the uh, Boccaccio's tales. For example, when the, ten, um, when the seven ladies and three men uh, leave Florence uh, and go off to tell their stories, they move into an area which is uh, very much identifiable as an ancient literary topos called the locus aminus, the sweet place, which is really a, a, a literary quotation, if you will, from ancient uh, Roman poetry. So they're receding from this kind of terrible turmoil of uh, Florence at the time into a kind of a, a literary creation, this locus aminus. And every time they move, when they're telling the stories and they move in after days two and five, the setting gets even more artificial, but also more artful. In turn, the seven ladies who actually have uh, names in the, uh, in, in the text have been read of allegories of the seven virtues. And the three men have been said to represent the three part division of the human soul, reason, anger, and lust. And Dionneo is going to, I'm still going to be spending a lot of time with him. Uh, remember him, he represents lust. So, in fact, they're not real people, they're actually just allegories of things. The structures of each of the days is very strict. Every day has a king or a queen who sets the topic, right? And a completely predictable format. Each day unspools in exactly the same way the 10 stories. There's an introduction, the stories, there's a song, and there's a dance, and then we move on to the next day. So it's a very artificially constructed, controlled kind of environment, the entire text. And even within the days, they're very controlled as well. The days talk to one another, I like to say. Day one and day nine are free topics, they're kind of bookends. Day four, love that ends unhappily. Day five, uh, lovers, uh, misfortune that turns to happiness. They sort of talk to one another, day five repairs day four, if you will, okay? So all of this is a, is a heavily, heavily constructed order-oriented kind of um, uh, uh, text. What is, uh, why is this there? Why, why does Boccaccio construct his text this way? What does all this structure do? Is Boccaccio suggesting and organizing his book this way that it's possible to escape that scary context of Florence and flee into some other kind of reality, which is a kind of artistic order. Put somewhat differently, perhaps, I think one might be able to say, rather than recommending uh, merely to escape or literature, text storytelling as mere escapism, is Boccaccio asking to what extent humanity can respond to crisis by controlling itself and its world by creating something better, okay? both of ourselves that we could do better or another kind of uh, artificeful, artful world. And what can the writer actually contribute to this? And I put here poet and I give you the Greek of the word uh, poesis, which actually means making. Poesis means making. It's the activity of bringing something into being that didn't exist before. Can we actually make something of the world, okay? In ordering it in this way. H how is Boccaccio thinking about this? Now, Boccaccio's response to this query, right, is can human artistry actually, and, and order and virtuous behavior in the stories, can it actually overcome the chaos of human nature? And Boccaccio says there's a sort of a problem with that. And that problem's name is the character Dionneo. And I told you that Dionneo stands for lust. He does stand for that. But he also demands at the end of day one to be exempt from having to follow the rules of, that everybody else has to follow in telling the stories in a certain way. He always says his story has to be the last one. So there's always somebody who says, I'm the exception. I'm not gonna follow the rules. It turns out the Dionysio stories actually are the ones that remind the brigade and in turn all of us as we read them that our basic human qualities which are sometimes kind of base human qualities like sexual desire and so on. And the not so pretty sides of our humanities can't be avoided 
in life as much as you try to constrain them. And the very famous examples uh, that were the possible, you could possibly have read are day three, story 10, and day 10, story 10. And remember, DNAO insists he always tells the last story of the 10 stories of each day. That story of Alabek and Rustico and putting the devil back into hell is an extraordinarily explicit discussion of a, of a monk in the desert who actually sees a young girl who wanders out into the desert to try to be pious and sort of seduces her and says, he, she should let him put his devil into her hell, if you get what the allegory is there, right? And she sort of enjoys it, right? So there's nothing stopping this kind of a lustful sort of celebration of things. And this is the kind of thing that DNA tells us about. The final story, uh, day 10, story 10, of Gualtieri and Griselda, the patient Griselda, is often read as a kind of Griselda um, uh, um, uh, be, uh, having Christ-like patience because her husband is abusing her and so on. But DNAO actually says, in fact, Gualtieri is a senseless brute. So brutality and sort of sexual lust and so on, it's hard to avoid them. It would be hard to control humanity, okay? And DNAO is always the last one to speak in any given day. What you actually think any of these things may have to do with whether we can control our lusts and humanity or not is something that Boccaccio says is up to us as readers. And I'll just read you this uh, epilogue of, uh, of the Decameron quickly. There will be those among you who will say that in writing these stories, I've taken too many liberties. This I deny. Like all other things in this world, stories, whatever their nature, may be harmful or useful, depending on the listener. No word, however pure, was ever wholesomely construed by a mind that was corrupt. And just as seemly language leaves no mark upon a mind that is corrupt, language that is less than seemly, Alabeck and Rustico, cannot contaminate a mind that is well ordered, any more than mud will sully the rays of the sun or earthly filth the beauties of the heavens. So if you take these stories only to be about sex, says Picaccio, the author, that's on you. You're the only one, not on him. He's not telling those stories that way. In the character of Dianeo, I'd like to suggest, Picaccio is sort of tipping his hand. Maybe this order of the stories, the distinction, right, is uh, between the sort of chaos of Florence and the orderly world of the Brigata is a really artificial one. That is this distinction between that chaotic world and the world under control. It's as unreal perhaps, Picaccio is saying, as the very possibility that there would be 17 Florentine ladies, seven Florentine ladies between the ages of 18 and seven, uh, 27, which is how old he says, that would be unmarried and they are unmarried. That's an that's a impossibility, it's a fiction. Maybe the distinction between the disorder of the world and the order of the world of the stories isn't so clear. In some of the stories, in fact, the plague is actually in the stories. The plague is sort of infiltrated into the stories where two lovers die with very sort of plague-like symptoms. And the Decameron is full of the plague of desire. Uh, Masetto, Masetto, the gardener, who goes and gardens in the convent uh, and uh, sleeps with all the nuns in the convent, or Perinella and the tub, uh, where she actually tricks her husband into buying the tub in which her lover is hiding. And again, the Filippo Bobducci story, okay? So all of this kind of plague of desire and plague of human lust is there. And there are cracks in the edifice of the hierarchical social value as well, where we have cross-class kind of love affairs between Gismonda and Guiscardo and Simona and Basquino, where the very high uh, princely classes, right, get involved with uh, lower uh, peasants and so on. So there are lots of things that are destabilizing the notion that everything is disorderly outside the world of the stories and orderly inside the realm of the stories. It's not. Upon closer examination then, the plague-ridden Florence actually penetrates into the stories. And so I think Boccaccio is asking us, what happens when a crisis hits? Can humanity actually control itself, correct its, feel, its weaknesses and foibles? And if so, by what means? Now he suggests that maybe we can control ourselves by means of love and fidelity, Throughout day four, there are figures who, who are so faithful to one another that they would rather die than uh, live without their lover, uh, Gismondo and Guiscardo again, Isabetta and her pot of basil, Girolamo and Salvestra. Maybe we can actually control our humanness through wit. Uh, very famously, uh, the, the tale of the three wings, Melchizedek and Saladin, 
where uh, Melchizedek sort of manipulates himself out of uh, being um, uh, victimized and, and exploited for his money by Saladin by telling a story. All of day seven is about tricks that women play on their husbands. Maybe, however, we can uh, repair our human failings by creating social equity. And as I mentioned, there is cross-class love affair. There are cross-class love affairs here as well. So maybe Boccaccio was saying, is, are these the ways that humanity can actually respond to crisis? Uh, oh yeah, this is a really beautiful little illustration of the, um, uh, the story of the three rings. There they are. And Melchizedek trying to use this story to get Saladin not uh, to exploit him for his money. In any case, this attempt to control the disorder uh, and Boccaccio suggesting that, do we really know what to do when there's this inescapable plague of being human and the possibility that human beings can control themselves by making certain decisions through wit or fidelity to their lovers and so on? How does he actually answer this question? Is it possible to control disorder? And Boccaccio's final answer, I think, is in that interesting outlier day of day 10, which are the stories of liberality and munificence. And in these stories, these are stories of almost impossible generosity and even magic in some cases where uh, uh, Messer Ansaldo actually creates a, has a garden bloom in the middle of January or a flying bed enables somebody to get back before his wife remarries and so on. As well as the very famous story, as uh, I mentioned before, of the patient Griselda. And this may be again, um, what, something that you're familiar with. Here's this very famous uh, painting now in the National Gallery in London of the story of the patient Griselda who was plucked by Mar the Marquise uh, uh, um, Guattieri out of poverty, made into a rich woman. She then has two children with him. He takes the children away and sends them away and so on. And even exiles her, in fact, and you see her here being exiled again, stripped of all her finery, right? And throws her back out. And she never says a word. She's very patient, Griselda. And at the very end, he welcomes her back, but only to sort of say, um, that this, uh, he's going to bring the children back, but he sort of says to Griselda, actually, it's his new wife that's going to marry. And could she please tell this young woman how to, to, um, to, to interact with him? And she says, yes, of course, I'll do that, all right? And the word that's used very often in day 10 to describe all of these activities is miraculous. It's a miracle that, that this can happen. I think that Boccaccio is suggesting in day 10 that it's pretty unlikely that Griselda-like people are going to actually be this way in the real world, that they're gonna be that patient. Only kind of magic could make people be that way. It might well be, and I think Boccaccio is saying this, that liberality and munificence is really hard to come by. And that the realities of human nature and the challenges that crisis situations represent are really challenging and that people are probably not gonna react in very good ways to them. That's what the sto story of, of day 10 seemed to say to me. Still in all, what he says, and going back to the epilogue, his last word, and I read part of it to you before, but he continues that epilogue and he says, all things have their special purpose, but when they're wrongly used, a great deal of harm may result. The same applies to my stories. If anyone should want to extract evil counsel from these tales or fashion an evil design, there's nothing to prevent him. But if anyone should study them for the usefulness and profit they might bring him, he will not be disappointed. So this, I think, is actually Boccaccio's, what he leaves us with. In crisis situations, you have to decide. Will you extract evil counsel and fashion evil design? Or will you be useful? Now, given the implicit challenge that Boccaccio is issuing to us here, the very end of day 10, it's interesting that the brigade follows Dionneo's uh, suggestion that they return whence they came and return to Florence. And I've always found it really odd that there's no mention made of the fact that the plague has subsided in Florence when they decide to return. It's only been about two weeks since they've been gone, the, the 14 days of, of quarantine and so on, okay? But there's no mention of this. It's almost as if the crisis of being human is always going to be there in Florence plague or no plague, we're always going to be human beings. And how we actually decide to act, right? The routines that we set up during any moment of isolation, like the ones we're looking at now, and how we sort of poetically structure and shape our lives, 
these are providing us, I think, our current routines with an opportunity to decide what to do in the midst of our new crisis, this crisis that we are facing now, which is also revealing, to be perfectly honest, the um, pre-existing crises of all kinds in the body politic of both our country and in the rest of the world. Now, according to Boccaccio, how we're going to act after we get out of this quarantine, our retreat from it, has a lot to do with how we make our decisions. Are we going to make them, and he says we should, in full recognition of the weaknesses of humankind? But we should also be aspire, I think Boccaccio says, to be poets, all of us, to be makers of our world, a new world capable of controlling our lesser selves, but also capable of creating sort of miraculous new uh, alternatives uh, to be better angels than we have been. So I think what Boccaccio in the long run is saying is that plagues actually challenge us to shape post-plague life. And this is the kind of thing that I learn from my conversations with past authors, in this case, from Boccaccio in particular, who in all of his humanity consented to converse with me. And I'm sure actually that he'll be happy to continue talking with us and with you uh, further now. So I'd, I'd love to answer some of your questions, any of your questions uh, that you had. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jane. That was that was wonderful. So uh, we have some questions, and the first one uh, asks about the composition of the storytellers, particularly the gender composition. Uh, you mentioned seven women, uh, three men. What does that tell us? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, channel Boccaccio a little bit. It's a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I, I'll be a, a philologue first, or just a dusty scholar first, and tell you that actually Boccaccio seems to have planned to have it be just women. Okay. It, it, initially, it was actually just going to be a, a, a seven-day tale. Um, and so uh, that accounts maybe for the preponderance of, of, uh, of, the, of the women. But I think also I could throw it back to the to the questioner and say, is uh, Boccaccio actually saying that it's the women who are going to, you know, carry the day these virtues, and we really have to look at the virtues, the cardinal virtues on the one hand, and the and the moral virtues on the other. Do we have to look at these virtues as being our kind of um, well of of um, um, uh, possible ways in which we can um, uh, deal with things? Now, just remember that in day seven in particular. Um, the women aren't always being virtuous, right? They are being witty uh, and they outsmart uh, their uh, nefarious husbands and so on so that they can go off and have dalliances with their, with their, uh, with their lovers. So it's not as if they're all gonna be chaste the entire time. They're, they're women who are self-celebratory as well. And many people say that this, this shows a side of Boccaccio as sort of proto-feminist. And he did write another text much later called De Claris Milieribus, in which he celebrates all the famous, wonderful women of the past. This said, he wrote another text in which he said, women were always at fault to everything. So to be honest, Boccaccio was not necessarily a big, a big feminist, but I think that we can see with the preponderance of the women that he's, he's quite interested in how we use these virtues. So we have another question about the reception of uh, the Decameron. I mean, who read it? Uh, when was it read? Um, why was it read? Well, depending on which of the stories you like best, uh, you can probably tell uh, it was very received as very bawdy. Um, and um, the, all these countless illustrations that I showed you, many of them coming very soon into the uh, early um, 15th century in the late uh, 14th, early 15th century, it circulated widely. Uh, it was very, very popular and illustrated. Uh, there've been something like, I think, 27 um, or something, I can't remember what the exact number is, of translations into English of the Decameron. Um, this kind of collection of stories actually was very um, uh, popular at the time. Actually, uh, so Boccaccio was just sort of following a tradition of collecting stories like this. Uh, and he's very much going against a certain kind of religious version of correcting stories, right? Where the hexameron, for example, was uh, the, creation of the, uh, the creation of the earth by God. So he was actually doing his Decameron as the creation of humankind by man, right? Um, so people liked these kinds of stories. And this one was widely, widely illustrated, uh, translated, and used. Chaucer, of course, um, in the uh, Canterbury Tales, uh, clearly knows Boccaccio. So there's a question, a philological question, about the chapter headings as well. 
Uh, were the chapter headings part of the work from its very first appearance? Yes, the lovely question. Yes, the um, and that that's uh, very much what uh, uh, Boccaccio, the author, says in the author's epilogue. You know, uh, he he gets criticized, or he says he gets criticized for having all these body tales that people can read and so on. And he remember he says, well, okay, if you take them as body, fine, that's that's on you, right? That's your responsibility. And besides, he says, uh, and this is the philological question. Um, uh, besides, he says. Um, I have, a, what does he say, a, a kind of a, um, it, it's, writ it's written on the brow, he says, of each story, what the body contains. And so he actually has put those, um, those headings at the top, right? So everybody knows what it's gonna be about. Um, so, they, so they were there to begin with, yes. And there's another question about uh, the influence of Petrarch, uh, particularly as a, in terms of uh, Boccaccio's reception of, of Dante. I mean, what kind of influence does Petrarch have on Boccaccio? Gosh, this is a completely learned, learned audience. My goodness, <laughs> I, I think maybe I better better go into my my Boccaccio here and sort of uh, get some of this. Actually, um, uh, Boccaccio really admired Petrarch. Um, he was a, a sort of traveled long distances to go see Petrarch um, in Venice. They they met at one point and so on. So he he really really did admire um, Petrarch. And so these are Dante and, and Petrarch and Boccaccio are known as the tre corone, the, the three crowns of Florentine um, poetry or literature. And they're sort of seen as a kind of a, a unit, even though they're different in time. Dante dies in 1321 uh, and, and uh, Boccaccio uh, later in the, in the 1370s. Um, and Petrarch, I think, dies before Boccaccio does, if I'm not mistaken. But they are seen sort of clustered together as those who created the Tuscan language as being the, um, the, the very, um, the epitome of a fine um, uh, uh, Italian language. Uh, the lang language of Italy at the time was very much in dialects all over Italy. And so what you spoke depended on where you came from. So you would speak a different Italian if you were in Venice, for example, or Rome or Florence. And it was through these three writers, through um, Dante, Petrarch, and uh, Boccaccio, that Florentine Tuscan, uh, the Tuscan language became what we now know as high. Uh, Italian. So basically, if you can read uh, Boccaccio or, or, or Dante, you can go talk with people in all over Italy today, because they all know these stories as well. So another questioner asks about uh, Boccaccio's portray portrayal of the clergy. Uh, and he, of course, betrays the clergy very, very badly. Mm -hmm. uh, how did readers respond to this? And, and also, how did the church respond? Was there uh, was he put on the naughty books list, for example? <laughs> he, he wasn't, he was, at this point, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a controversy, really. Uh, you'll notice that within the stories, whenever there's a story of, of some of these um, nuns, for example, or prioresses in a convent, uh, actually themselves getting involved in illicit sexual things and so on, or the various priests uh, having affairs with their parishioners and so on, right? Is that in the, in the frame story part of it, all of the Brigata, they laugh at this and they, they're very amused by it, right? Um, just because uh, tar lampooning the clergy was a, a kind of a normal thing to do, okay? To, 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 to make fun of the clergy. Um, and it's kind of not, not by chance that we see you know, much, it's really, I mean, it's a little bit later, but it's, you know, not too much later, right, where we get the, uh, the um, Protestant Reformation taking aim at some of the sinfulness, really, uh, of the Catholic Church. Um, it, it, there's a little bit of debate, and some scholars say that um, Boccaccio actually abjured the Decameron. He, he went on to write some very, very learned, pious things, uh, uh, celebrating virtuous women, as I said, the, of concerning famous women, De Claris Mulieribus. And he, he began to write a, a commentary, a very dense philological commentary on, on, on um, Dante's Divine Comedy. So there's some people who read that as saying that he was sort of ditching this kind of bawdiness, right? Because he thought I got to leave that behind me and not, um, not really sort of play up the fact that I wrote this. And not only did I write it, but I wrote it in Italian so everybody could read it. Uh, things after that he wrote later in his life, he wrote in Latin uh, just for maybe the educated classes. So, so there have been scholarly arguments made that he kind of turned his back on this when he realized that it was too body. I don't know, people didn't think of it that way. It was, as I said, widely, widely read and widely received. So how, how soon was it translated out of Italian into another language? 
happened. And... Ooh, you got you got me on that one. Um, I think that as I don't know the exact dates, I should have looked that up. I'm sorry. I, I do know, for example, that 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 Chaucer was, um, you know, of course Chaucer uh, probably read a little bit of an Italian anyway. But the, so I there there I, I actually don't know the answer. So I will plead. I could I could Google it, but that would make my screen look weird. So I could Google it, but but it, but it was quickly translated into other languages. Well, it's 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 partly itself a translation from other languages as well. Many of these uh, tales are either originally text uh, tales from the ancient Roman um, uh, storyteller Apuleius. So they were in some in some of the stories you can actually see Apuleius's uh, Latin kind of word for word translated into Italian or some of the uh, early um, French tales, which are called fabliaux, which are, are kind of body tales themselves. Um, and so that we see some of these fabliaux actually repeated. They are the basis of the stories in, in the Decameron. So there's a kind of fluidity, you know, between uh, a lot of these languages, um, the Romance languages all coming out of, out of Latin anyway. So uh, I have another rather long question, which I'm gonna to read to you. Many of the stories in day three, for example, seem astonishingly, astonishingly sex positive, especially <laughs> in the happy-go-lucky way they portray women's sexual desire. How unusual is this for the time? Oops, I just lost one second. How unusual is this for the time? Are there other works of the period or works that were being read then that also speak of women's desire with the same lack of inhibition or condemnation? Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so the notion that women were supposed to famously be, uh, what is it, chaste, silent, and obedient? Uh, that was the uh, uh, the sort of three things that the early modern, the late medieval, early modern women were supposed to be chaste, silent, and obedient. Um, is sort of contravened by quite a number of texts of this period. The, one of the ones from which Dante, uh, Dante, uh, uh, Boccaccio. Um, uh, pulls really is a, a collection of a uh, hundred stories called the Novellino in Italian, in which we do have women, you know, being very uh, desirous also of things like, I want a new dress tonight, so go out and get me a new dress, right? I mean, so there's, there's nothing, there women really are sort of talking back, if you will, um, to some of these stereotypes. Um, and it's, it's interesting that um, some people are, are, are fascinated by these early collections. Uh, I think something like the Novellino has just really fallen out. People don't really read it so much anymore. Right? So the, if we were to read these earlier texts, we might have a different idea of what's normal behavior for women, you know, both in the Western tradition and now, if we saw that it's the, it's a kind of a long tradition of, of women's desire being expressed. There's also a question about patronage. And, and as we know, a lot of artists and writers of the time had patrons. So did Boccaccio have a patron or several patrons? And, and if so, what, were, what was the impact or influence of, of these patrons on him? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, uh, Boccaccio's uh, biography is really fascinating and, and, and the, the questioner should, should look into it just as a, as a, maybe if you wanna find out what it really meant to be a writer you know, in this earlier period. So Boccaccio was uh, an illeg the illegitimate son of a Florentine merchant banker. And we don't really know who his mother was. Some people say that she was a French woman that his father met on a banking trip. You know, other people say that's probably not the case because he retired to a town not very far from Florence when he, when he got um, older. And he was destined uh, originally to, to, to be a, um, a lawyer and a, and a banker. He worked for his, he moved when he was about 13. His father moved them to Naples, to the town of Naples. And he began to be very involved in kind of business affairs. Um, that was what he, you know, was gonna be, that's what his profession was gonna be. Um, and and the, all the time he was, you know, writing various kinds. He wrote many, many texts um, uh, before he wrote the Decameron actually. And so he was sort of trying out the possibility of being a, uh, being a writer. Uh, even as he had his day job, you know, of it. and you can see, I think the the tra uh, the trails or the echoes really of the uh, of his early life, because so many of the people in the tales uh, of of the Decameron are kind of bankers and the bourgeoisie merchants and so on, right? So these are people he saw in his immediate environs. Um, so so that's what he he actually was going to be his 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 work. You know, I mean, that's what he, what he was going to, that was going to be his job, right? And then he, um, and then he turned to sort of doing this full time. But there were very few kind of just pure poets, actually, or pure literati people. Um, 
in the in the late uh, medieval and early modern period, other than if they were clerics or something. But but the rest of them really did. Um, some of the most famous uh, writers um, that I have have worked on actually were politicians who spent their time doing politics and stuff and would write their plays and poetry and so on, you know, on their own time. Um, so there wasn't this kind of set distinction really. And I think you can see that especially clearly in Boccaccio is that his, the, the camera is sort of permeated by the, by the reality of life in um, Naples. And he spends quite a, quite a long time in Naples before he goes back to Florence. So talk to us about your favorite character in, in the Decameron. Who is the favorite? Who is your favorite character and why? Mm, oh gosh, that's a that's a tough one. That, that would really uh, that would really I would expose my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could say that Ser Ceparello is my favorite, but then you might think badly of me. Uh, so he's he's the one in day one, story one, who can kind of um, get away with everything, right, and still get beatified at the end. But I don't think I better tell you, you know, that that he's my favorite one. So it's um, not Patient Griselda. No, it's definitely not Patient Griselda. <laughs> uh, and I, I, Patient Griselda is an incredibly interesting story because, as I said, it's. Um, it's Dionéo's story, and he prefaces it by saying, um, you know, Gualtieri, who does this to, to his young wife, um, is a brutal, brutal coward, right? And so anybody who does anything like this to a woman and any woman who puts up with it is just not to be believed, right? And I, maybe, maybe I kind of like the story, even if I don't like the characters, because I like what the story tells us, you know, is that this, this is a, a scenario that has become very, very clear. I mean, it's also been read as a kind of a Christ story, right? I mean, very, very much that she's raised up from a kind of, you know, prim, uh, humble origins and so on, and then um, is sort of sacrificed and then gets redeemed at the end. So it's been read in that way. Um, but I think kind of taken as a whole, it's a really interesting thing. Um, I love the stories of day seven, which are how women get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, a concluding question, I, I, I want to ask you about the nature of storytelling. Uh, what the fact that the response to um, human foibles, the response to a crisis is through storytelling. And that's a very, very humanities perspective. So can you wax poetic for us uh, about the importance of storytelling in the era of the pandemic and, and what Boccaccio is, is instructing us to do? Yeah, I think it's a it's a fabulous way to kind of uh, take together what it is that we're all doing here in our book club. Uh, you know, we're we're reading texts and we're we're investigating them, looking deeply into them, and saying um, how can we actually use what we read in not just literary text. I mean, all texts, all humanistic texts. Right? How can we actually look into them and and have conversations with them. And I guess that's, that's how I read, right? Is I, I read in order to have a conversation with a text, right? I don't read just to be entertained or, um, I actually, well, I sometimes read detective novels to be distracted, but but mostly I'm, I'm always sort of saying, um, reading any kind of literature is a, is a way of actually interrogating how we're going to respond to anything. And I re mean it very, very seriously when I say that a poet for me um, is somebody who is making and shaping uh, the possibilities for a new world. And in that respect, we're, we're all poets. We're all makers, right? Is that we, we read fiction or we read history and then we sort of say, okay, how are we gonna take this and, and shape our world after what the kind of conversations we've had with these books? So I, I think that there's, um, uh, I hope anyway, always an afterlife to reading always something that will be a real a realizable afterlife from reading and that we don't just put the book away and say got to go back to life but rather we say we're going to go into life with this book thank you professor jay newman for a wonderfully insightful and stimulating conversation ladies and gentlemen please join us again next wednesday evening at seven o'clock eastern time for our virtual book club, where Professor Bart Harriman from Duke University will be talking about the invention of heaven and hell. If you'd like to learn more about the National Humanities Center mission and its programs, please go to our website at nationalhumanitycenter.org. I'm Robert Newman. Thank you very much for joining us. Be safe and be well. Good night. <laughs>